This episode is brought to you by One World Empowered. Hey there, tired mama. Do you wish you could push a reset button on your energy? Like, do you want to keep up with those energizer bunnies that are running around you all day? I know, I know, I know. I feel ya. Coffee can only do so much. Well, don't you worry. I've got you covered. Now just imagine a community of mamas who know the struggle and are working together to harness and reclaim their energy. We're talking about a true community of mamas who get it. Daily practices to jumpstart your days, accountability partners, group coaching calls to ground and recenter you throughout the 28 days. Does this sound like the exact dose of medicine you need in order to feel 100% again? If so, This program is exactly what you need if you want to be more present with your kiddos, if you think a new routine will help you maximize your time and you enjoy having an accountability partner to help you with developing that new routine and those new habits, if you'd like to increase your patience and energy all while reducing your stress and anxiety, and if you think it would be amazing to have an understanding community of mamas who get it and are on the same path towards healing. Mama, Today is the day you choose you and level up. Come join our 28-day energetic reset for moms by visiting www.oneworldempowered.com slash work with me and click the learn more option next to the energetic reset program or just scroll down and click the link in my show notes below. I can't wait to meet you and witness you step into your full potential. See you there, mama. You're listening to the Empower to Heal podcast. I'm your host, Dina T, and I'm so excited to take you on a journey through stories of everyday experts as we share the ways we've harnessed the power inside us to improve the quality of our lives and the health of our minds. We're so excited to have you here with us and hope you feel inspired and empowered to heal. Hello, you beautiful souls. Happy Thursday. I'm actually recording this on a Monday and I just made myself a ginormous smoothie (laughs) on accident. So I had these like little mini like self-serve blender cup thingies and well they broke after a bajillion years of using them and so I've resorted to the ninja blender like the big size blender and I was just always of the mindset to fill it all the way to the top and So I've been filling my big blender to the top every single time I forget. (laughs) And I just made myself a smoothie that's like four cups of smoothie. So needless to say, I'm about to burst. I think I'm down to two cups, so halfway through it. (laughs) And I really, really don't want to waste it. Smoothies are something that give me so much energy because I can pack them full of nutrients and vitamins and I always put MCT oil in them, which is like my brain booster. It just like snaps me into gear so I can get stuff done. And while I was drinking this, I was thinking about self-care. And I've kind of been bubbling a little bit lately of like there's all these cliche things that pop up on social media and that people say to do in order to take care of yourself. And they're usually things that drive me bonkers, like take a bubble bath or light a candle or I don't know, have a glass of wine, do a facial, facial Fridays. I don't know. And if you guys do these things, cool, power to you. But what gets me upset is that we use these these things, these cliche things or these little like Instagram posts as a way to say, take care of yourself. And it gives the wrong message. And I really, really, really want to spend time talking about this today because I came from a background of social work where self-care is vital. But the interpretation of what self-care is, is so far from the reality that It becomes toxic. People think they are doing these things to take care of themselves and they're not getting the results. And that like round robin effect is pretty rough. And we're just keep like continuing to tell each other to do these things or oh, go home and take a rest. Why don't you unplug for a day? Take a bubble bath. I'll see you tomorrow. Cool. Great. Well, (laughs) 
(laughs) that's not really the things that our brain and our bodies need to recoup after hard stuff. So I wanted to come together to talk about that because I think every single person in this universe has stressors on hand that they experience that may require them to find ways to take care of themselves. And I feel like that deserves some airtime and some opportunity to talk about what in the world does that actually mean and how do we kind of wade through the bull crap that we hear left and right about ways to take care of ourselves that just aren't serving us. So as I got to think around where did this come from? Where did we go wrong in talking about self-care like this? I I don't know where we we went wrong. I feel like maybe it started as like a clever marketing ploy or something to get us to buy all the bougie things and tell us that we we need these special bubble baths or get the nice fine wine or go on this really cool experience. We're not taking care of yourself unless you're you have these things. You're buying these things. Maybe it started there. Maybe marketing just picked up on an opportunity when they saw people like using self-care in this kind of surface level. I'm not really sure. But somewhere down the line, we started to equate self-care with these materialistic type of things or these like simplified actions. And we completely lost sight of what self-care truly is. So coming from a social work field, I remember in school, We were trained a lot on self-care. It was in my undergraduate training. It was in my graduate training, but none of it was truly rooted in what self-care is. It was like this concept that we had to do it if we are going to survive. It was vital. It was important. Remember to take care of yourself. And then in the same breath, there was like this dialogue happening around like, Social workers are overworked and underpaid. You're going to work the long, hard hours. You're going to do the hard things. You're going to see the painful, most gruesome experiences you may ever see. And you're going to be the one helping people through that. And you're not going to be compensated in a way that is going to justify what you do. But wear that like a badge of honor. And there's like this constant like communication and like maybe joke telling you can say around, I don't do it for the pay. Like I'm in social work. I don't do it because it pays well. Or I love my job. I sure don't do it for the pay. And these types of sayings just kind of reinforce the fact that we're doing hard things and we're not seeing ourselves as valued or valuable. And I'm not saying that our value is always measured or our worth is always measured in a way of compens- like monetary compensation, but it creates a fundamental mindset that we're going to be doing hard things and that we have to sacrifice ourselves or what we are worth or what we need in order to do the hard work that we do. And that is just absolutely toxic, especially in working in a hard field. So the majority of people that come to the social work field come to this field because they want to help. They see social injustice in the world and they want to make a difference. And they see that either in the lens of a macro lens, like policy and the larger picture of a world, or maybe they see that in the lens of healthcare, or maybe that they see that in a like one-on-one type of lens of working through like poverty, homelessness, hunger, domestic violence, you name it. And the other portion of people that come to this field come here because they themselves have been impacted in some sort of way. And a social worker or someone in the helping field changed their lives and they want to give back and do that too. And so we have these types of perspectives of like people come to this field because they're like helpers. And if you know anything about being a helper, typically we have some personality traits that are kind of undermining for us and helping people may stroke the ego. And then you have the people that have come to this field because they want to continue to give back and help others. And if I might be missing a category, I don't mean to leave anybody out, but in essence, those are the large two categories that I've experienced over my years in the field. 
And in social work courses, we are armed with a crap ton of knowledge, a lot of clinical interventions, a lot of research, strategies to help others. We're repeatedly told to take care of ourselves. We understand the gravity of what we're going to do. We attend these courses that bring you to your knees that you have to role play in, that you hear hard information and it makes you cry. And that's kind of some of the training to organize and get get your brain ready for what you might experience. But it's still very different than the actual experience of doing this work and being in the field and having a one-on-one moment in a crisis situation or navigating big stuff. I want to share with you a little bit about my first internship in this field. I was in my undergraduate studies and I started to, um, I started my internship at a domestic violence shelter. Mind you, I grew up in a way where violence was not a common experience in my life. I was very sheltered and I was very blessed in every way to protect me from having to be exposed to that reality. So a lot of what I saw about violence was on TV or in my training of my schooling. And in this domestic violence shelter, I met some of the most beautiful, amazing women and their children, and their stories were absolutely devastating. To hear what they went through was absolutely devastating. And I would sit through intakes and hear over and over again, these horror stories play out of what somebody just survived and how they escaped. And I would answer the phone on the domestic violence like hotline phone and I would talk to people in crisis trying to escape big moments and trying to feel out, do I need to call 911? How do I help them get to safety? Do we have space available for them to come stay at our shelter? And triage the situation. And this one time, a lady came in and she was just released from the hospital after being stabbed brutally. And she came to seek shelter at our domestic violence shelter. And she had wounds, like gaping wounds that had to be cleaned and fixed regularly. And she would share her story of what happened to her and you could see the physical toll on her body. And we would have investigators calling to try and treat what was going on. And I'd hear another story about a child dying in a fire and what that was like. And just over and over again, and I started to experience this thing called vicarious trauma or secondary trauma. I became traumatized by the stories I was hearing because I wasn't ready or prepared to navigate that extreme amount of of pain and heartache and trauma, not even hearing it and trying to digest it. And I remember going home and starting to have nightmares about this happening. And I was still in school at this point and nothing that I had learned in school was helping me through that. And I started to have to figure out, okay, like I want to be in this field. I want to do this hard work. I want to work with these kids who have gone through things like this. I want to and I will make a difference in this area and my determination came out and my realization came out of like what are you going to do to navigate this and I myself found a coping tool of like stick my nose in a book work my tail feather off work 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 and then sleep at night and if you have nightmares you have nightmares and then keep going (laughs) it was like this maladaptive coping tool of like chug 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 stuff it down and I, I didn't kind of know what to do with it until my internship was over and I went to grad school and I shifted into a different type of internship for grad school and I started having to do a deep dive and look into myself around how am I going to navigate the bigness of all that this is and we as social workers are trained on providing clinical interventions to other people to help them regulate their bodies, to help them regulate their minds and heal their minds, but we often don't use them for ourselves. There is like this, I don't know, like you're a hypocrite in a way, telling all these people to do these things, and then you're sitting over here like, oh no, I'm good, I don't have to do any of that, and lo and behold, you guys, those things are the things that create care for yourself. They give your mind and your body what they need to heal. And so if there's any social workers out there listening to this, if you're in the helping profession and fields, mental health uh, field, 
practice what you preach, you guys. That's your self-care. That's your help. So fast forward like a bajillion years, not really, fast forward a good five years or so, and I'm working in a field, working with children with mental health needs, and I am in some trainings to try and understand what, what, how do we, how do we increase retention rates? So this is a hard job and a big job. And we have a lot of turnover. And having such high turnover is something we've got to try and treat and figure out. And I remember hearing some scenarios equate our type of work to that of first responders like firefighters. And as I was listening to that, I started thinking through, okay, what does that mean? So firefighters are doing hard work. They have to run into burning buildings. They're the first on the scene for really terrifying situations. They oftentimes see the hardest, most scary stuff, and they have to respond and deal with it in the moment. How come they have higher retention rates and people stay as a firefighter for years and years on end? But for us, we can't figure that out. And so I did some digging and one of my dearest friends is a firefighter and as I learned what it was like for him to be a firefighter and for him to become a firefighter, I learned that there's so much more than we think that creates a strong mind and resilience and just because there's not turnover doesn't mean that the health, the mental health and wellness of the firefighters is healthy. So for instance, to become a firefighter, you have to go through academy. And to go through academy, you have to basically pass tests and be vetted in to be a firefighter in the first place. One thing of what you do not need to do in order to be a social worker. <laughs> I mean, you go to school to be a social worker, but you do not have to go through any type of like boot camp per se. And in order to go through academy, it is like an extreme rigorous training that is training your body physically and your mind mentally in order to navigate the biggest, hardest things you could experience, like running into a burning building, saving people who are dying. And what it takes to do that in academy is repetition and practice and running drills over and over and over and over and over again, building that muscle memory, physical muscle memory and emotional muscle memory. And you do it with a cohort. You do it with teams. You have people who become like family to you that you are in your your academy with and you get through hard things together. You can laugh together. You can cry together. You can sweat together. You puke together. You sleep together. <laughs> you literally do everything together. And so you have a, con- a support system, a connected support system that truly understands and gets it. You have resources on hand in order to treat your own mental health needs and your physical health needs. You have a gym that you have access to while you're at academy or while you're working to work your body out. You have drills that you run and you have celebrations that you do together in order to honor the progress that you're making. And then when you become a firefighter, you're connected to a station. And a station has a group of people that you are always working with. And you're working with each other long days and nights, and then you're off for a day and a night. And how they structure the days on and the days off, I think it's very wise. It creates camaraderie with your teammates. You get through hard things. You have time to slow down and rest your brain. And they're trying to validate and find value. And you need your time off too. You need to have a family. There's a big value of family for firefighters. And so when I think of like the equivalency between firefighters and how that relates to like social workers... Social workers don't even compare to what firefighters are doing. And I'm not using firefighters as the standard for how to be good at doing hard work. Not at all. Don't hear me say that. I'm just saying that there's a misinterpretation and a misrepresentation of how social workers can get better at reducing retention rates. I think that our work is 
comparing itself to work that we will never equate to when it comes to support systems, structure, resources, mind training, and physical training. So really to sum all of this up, I really want to create space for us to honor humans. We all are doing big things. All of you beautiful souls are doing something big in your life. That's hard. Whether you're a social worker, a firefighter, or a caretaker, or an accountant, I don't care what your job is. You're a human. And as a human being, life has stress. And as we experience stress, we need to know and understand what it means to take care of ourselves. And I'm not, again, talking about the bubble baths or the glass of wine at the end of the night. (laughs) I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about how do we tune in to our bodies and our souls to understand what we really need and give ourselves that. Do you hear that? understand ourselves and then give it to us give ourselves what we need in order to be healthy and well (laughs) so I think of big moments I had at work moments that I reflect on that were hard and they could have been traumatic (laughs) moments where I I dove from knives being wheeled around dove from punches, chased after kids running away, separated people in fights, de-escalated moments between police and and escalated children and parents. (laughs) And all of these things, they required me to think fast, to create safety, to de-escalate big moments, to mitigate the audience that was around us and, and create recovery. And these moments took a lot of practice to get good at. No amount of bubble baths afterwards created the care I needed for myself. (laughs) Do you know what actually did create that care? Do you know what actually did? An understanding of my own stress response system and how I regulate it. An understanding of what fills my cup in a day a connection to my why. Why am I doing this hard work in the first place? Harmony in my life across all fields. A sense of purpose. Teammates that get it. Making light of big moments with those teammates just to laugh for a moment. These are the things that made the biggest difference in my life. So I want to challenge you guys here. I want you guys to stop for a moment, not reactively when you're having a stressful day, but do it now proactively. When cooler, calmer heads prevail, you're going to get better results. So we want to take a deep breath and tap into ourselves and assess and understand what is our body screaming out that we need. And if it's a bubble bath, maybe that's it. Chances are though, it's going to be something pretty significant. Something like, you need to feel understood. You need to feel safe. You need to have a sense of predictability in your days. Because, good Lord, having these ups and down crises all the time make you feel out of whack. You need to feel secure. You just need a laugh right? Whatever it is, whatever it is that you need, understand it. And then live in that moment for a minute. Like, okay, that's what I need. That's what, that's what I'm screaming out in this dysregulated moment. And then ask yourself, how can I get that? How can I give myself that? I have the power to give myself that. It does not rely on anybody else's decision making. It does not rely on anything outside of my control. It doesn't rely on access to money. None of that. Because guess what? We can only control ourselves. And when we fixate on the things outside of us that we can't access to feel better, we lose sight of what we can do to meet our own needs. And there is a lot of tools in this world that we can access, that are at our fingertips, that we can use in order to meet our own needs. But we've got to take a minute to sit in it. And if we're struggling to figure out how to meet our needs, confide in somebody. 
talk to somebody you, you trust and believe in or someone you know, someone that maybe understands and gets it, a coworker, a leader, a friend, a family member, talk to them and tell them, this is how I'm feeling lately. And this is what I think I need, or this is what I know I need. I'm struggling to figure out how to meet that need and see if they can help generate some ideas. But when those ideas come up, this is important for you guys to know. If somebody else is suggesting ideas for you, you got to check in with them within your body. Does it feel good? Does it sound right? Just because they're suggesting it doesn't mean you have to do it. Just because somebody's got a great idea doesn't mean that it's yours to use or implement. And you don't have to people please. The people who are giving you ideas, right? They're not giving you ideas because they want you to like smile and nod. They're giving you ideas because they want to help and they genuinely want it to work. So if you're getting these ideas, check in with yourself and see, does this match? Does this align with who I am? Does this feel like it might make a difference? Is this safe? Is this legal? I don't know. Ask yourself the good questions, right? (laughs) And then try it. Try it in a safe way. Try it in a way that's your own. Make it your own. Go out and do something just for you. Practice what you preach. (laughs) I truly believe that if we can shift the understanding of what self-care is and meet that, then we're going to be treating a lot of this chronic stress that we have in our lives, the things that we can control. And I do want to do a little plug here because... Sometimes we need boundaries. And if you're a helper out there listening to this, you might be like, boundaries, what? You crazy. I'm serious. Especially as helpers, we struggle with understanding what our boundaries are or what they need to be. Sometimes establishing boundaries is the self-care that you need. And boundaries can, holy moly, boundaries can look like anything right? In my mind, boundaries aren't like this black and white box that you create to live within. Boundaries are definitions of relationships for yourself and and with other people. Boundaries are things that set this guideline or this understanding of respect and love and light and care that you need. I think boundaries could be a whole nother conversation, but boundaries aren't always like, I'm setting my boundaries and I'm only working nine to five. That might be your boundary, but also like that's a pretty superficial boundary if you're doing helping work. And I'm not saying you are superficial. I'm saying that that boundary is not going to serve you the way that you want it to. If it's a time boundary like that and you're doing it to fit into the box of the greater society of we work nine to five, that's not individualized for you. That's not matching your harmony and your why. If it matches your harmony, the harmony you need in your life across all systems, across all frameworks, across work, life, friends, family, fun, sleep, every every framework you need, then cool that boundary serves you, right? If it's a boundary that supports your why, why the heck you do this in the first place, and that fulfills you, that gives you purpose, that helps you feel accomplished, that makes you feel like you're working towards your goal, cool, like that works. But check in with your boundaries too when you're practicing your quote unquote (laughs) self-care. And I hope that you guys listening to this truly take a minute to unplug and tap into yourself. Ask yourself what you truly need. How are you going to meet it? Because you have the power within you to do it. And then take action. Thank you, beautiful souls. I truly hope that this episode inspired you to think through self-care differently. And I really, really look forward to seeing your posts and your comments about what you are doing to care for yourself in an authentic way. And to start talking about self-care in a different way so that we can create a healthy culture around what caring for yourself truly means. Thank you so, so much for tuning in today. I hope you are feeling inspired and empowered in your own healing journey. I know that many of you listening might be reflecting on your own stories that you may feel called to share. If so, please reach out to me at dinat 
at EmpowerToHeal.com. That's D-E-N-A-T at Empower, the number two, Heal.com. Or drop me a message through my Instagram handle at Empower, the number two, Heal. I would love to connect with you and learn about your journey so that we can hopefully continue to spread these powerful life lessons on empowering ourselves to heal. My contacts will also be linked in the show notes below so that you can easily find me. We are so eager to start a movement in showcasing the many ways we can heal. And you can be part of this movement too by capturing images and tagging them hashtag empower the number two heal on Instagram. We look forward to seeing all the ways that you are empowered to heal. I love you beautiful souls and thank you so, so much. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and review.